I just wanted so badly to be having fun, be doing the things that I thought someone my age should be doing, that I forgot to consider that how someone treats me is the most important thing about them. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? <laughs> no way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Perfect on paper and in photographs. That's what you might assume about Gabrielle Korn's life and career. She was named the youngest editor-in-chief in the history of Nylon Magazine. It was a dream job, and the perks that came with it were enviable. The parties, the free clothes, the access and invites to parties and events. Who wouldn't find happiness in the Lux life as an editor-in-chief of a fashion magazine? Behind the scenes, though, the story was different. In fact, perfection wouldn't come close to defining the challenges Gabrielle faced in her life. In her new book, Everybody Else is Perfect, How I Survived Hypocrisy, Beauty, Clicks, and Likes, Gabrielle walks through her views and experience with internet feminism, impossible beauty standards in social media, shifting ideals about sexuality, and so much more. I'm cruising through her book. It's an incredible and eye-opening read, and so getting to chat one-on-one with this author and dig into her life and her experience is such a gift. We're talking social media, the concept of ideal clients, powerful women, and more. Here she is, Gabrielle Korn. Thanks to Gusto for supporting the Gold Digger podcast. Gusto offers modern, easy payroll and benefits to small businesses across the country. They were even named Best Online Payroll by PC Mag. Get three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash gold digger. Start and grow your email list in 2021 with Flowdesk. Start a free 30-day trial, no credit card necessary, plus lock in at 50% off your monthly subscription when you fall in love at jennacutcher.com slash Flowdesk. That's jennacutcher.com slash F-L-O-D-E-S-K. All right, Gabrielle, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to talk with you today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk to you too. So I told you, and I actually slid into your DMs because I downloaded your book when it was on pre-sale, not knowing that it wasn't out at the time. And I was so bummed because I was like, yes, this is what I need to read right now. And so when it came out, I dove in and I messaged you like one day into reading your book. And I was like, I need to talk to you. This is so incredible. And so your new book comes out and it's talking about how you found success at a young age and the way people often discounted or responded to your success in regards to your age. And so talk to me about your experience and kind of where you've been in your career. Totally. Well, first of all, thank you. I totally would have just sent you an advanced copy of the book. (laughs) Well, I was so bummed because it sold me. I read all about it and then it was like, it will download on the day it is released. And I was like, Kindle, you're killing me. (laughs) I know. It's so weird to have to do like press before a book comes out because you never know if people are going to wait around for it or just forget. But you know, I'm glad that you downloaded it. But anyway, so as to the actual question you asked me, so I became the editor in chief of Nylon when I was 28. And at the time, I was the youngest editor in chief in New York City. And it wasn't amazing. It was like, in order to achieve it, I had made my entire 20s about my career and hadn't really focused on things like finding the right person to be with or taking care of myself in terms of my emotional, physical, or mental health. And beyond that, I was really taken advantage of because I was so young. It was like I was doing the same job and held to the same standards as an editor-in-chief who would have 20 years of experience on me, but I was paid, you know, like a successful 28 year old, which is I was making around a hundred K and like, that's a great salary 
for someone who's that age and has that experience level. But for the work I was doing, it was pretty ridiculous. And it was like, I was being thrown into this world where I had access to certain things through my job that in my real life, I was nowhere near attaining. So it was this very weird kind of like out of body experience of on the one hand, having this title on this platform, and on the other hand, like really struggling in a lot of ways. Yeah. One of the things about your story that I loved is that you were a woman who was not afraid to ask for a raise. And I loved that piece of your story because then just a few years later, when you found yourself in that power role, in that role of leadership, you were getting young, ambitious women asking you the same thing. And you kind of had a different perspective on that. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, I... I had thought that like by the time it was up to me that I would do a better job. And I don't think that I always did because I was so stressed out by the big picture and like of knowing how much money we had and how much money everyone was making that it was really stressful to have to tell people no. And by the time I became editor in chief, I think I had a better handle on it. But up until that point, it was just like, oh my God, like this isn't up to me. Why do people think I have say over anything? And that didn't necessarily change when I became editor in chief, like every single dollar I spent still needed to be approved by someone else. But by that point, I felt like I could respond with, thank you so much for asking me. I'm so glad you did. This is not up to me but I will do everything I can to get you there. And it it took me a while to develop the skills to do that. But once I did, it ended up being really positive. And I, I tried to be really transparent wherever possible. Like someone came to me and said that she felt like her salary needed to be doubled, which was really eerie because that was like the same exact conversation that I had <laughs> had with my boss a few years prior. And he was really mean to me in that moment yeah. and didn't give me any sort of context about his response. So what I said to her was like, look, like if we doubled your salary, you would be making more than the highest paid member of your team. And she is 10 years older than you. Yeah. So I, yeah. I really just tried to like be as honest as possible instead of like shrouding money in mystery, which I think upholds the stigma around it and makes women afraid to ask for more. Oh, I think that's so powerful. And one of my favorite pieces of your journey was all of the steps that you took to land the role of editor in chief. Now you were your dream was to write and get paid to write and and in that part of the book where you're watching a TV show and reviewing it and getting paid, you know, $50 <laughs> an article or whatever. It's like I think a lot of people go through life with this idea like if I could only get paid to do this one thing. Yeah. What was it like when you discovered one that you could get paid to do that one thing, but maybe that one thing wasn't as fulfilling as you had thought? It sucked. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because it was like, you can't get paid to do something at your leisure in a way that is sustainable. Like if you're looking to make a living, work is work. And what I found was that, yeah, I could get paid to write, but the volume of writing that I had to do in order to keep my full-time job was totally unsustainable. It was like, When I was starting out at Refinery, it was up to 10 stories a day. And in hindsight, I don't know how I did that, but it was like, I was just so committed to being a professional writer. And I was just like, this is just what I have to do. And then like all creative fields, the unfortunate thing is that if you're really good at it and you stay in it and, you know, excel and succeed, the next steps take you further and further away from the thing you love to do. So I was suddenly editing other people and managing other people and writing less and less and less. Isn't that wild when you find yourself in this role that all of a sudden you're thrust into a boss position or a superior position? And it's like, wait, like I'm not, I'm not even doing what I loved. And now I'm also like managing people. Walk me through what does an editor in chief do for anyone that's listening and they don't know the Miranda Priestleys of the world? And is it really like that? (laughs) So, okay, basically, It's both an internal and external role. So internally, I, so I was a digital editor in chief. I never oversaw a magazine 
but that meant I had 20 people under me. They were the editorial team, which was writers and editors, the art department, video and social media. And it was my job to have the editorial vision, to implement the vision, to choose our monthly themes and our cover stars, to work on big picture projects. There were a couple people who I edited. I brought in new freelancers. Basically, like you have a bird's eye view of how everything works and it's your job to keep it moving. And I managed every single person, which in hindsight was a total mistake. And I <laughs> and I reported directly to the CEO who oversaw the sales team. So I was also kind of the go-between between edit and sales to try to figure out how we could partner with advertisers to keep the lights on. And then externally, I was the face of the brand, which meant I was representing the company at industry events like Fashion Week, traveling around, meeting with people and working on new initiatives to try to expand what it was we did. So like there was a period of time when we were trying to make a TV show. And so I was in LA a lot meeting with producers, things of that nature. It was like, there was no one typical day. It was just the baseline was chaos. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that sounds exhausting first and foremost, but I want to know how did that impact your personal life? Walk me through some of the ups and downs of your world beyond work in your 20s and even into your 30s. Yeah. So it was a mess. Like, basically, I started dating someone my senior year of college. And she and I stayed together for five years. And being in that long term relationship kind of allowed me to focus so much on work in my early 20s, because like, we weren't going out. (laughs) We were just like (laughs) at home with our dog, you know, like, it was really easy because I had a stable home life to focus a lot on my career. And then when I turned 26, I like woke up one morning and was just like, Oh my God, nothing in my life looks like how I want it to look, which I think is like a pretty common quarter life crisis moment. And we had been living in Queens together and we broke up. I moved to Brooklyn. It was the first time I had lived on my own. It was the first time I had been on dating apps and, and I was working at Nylon at the time, which was great because the hours weren't as rigid as they had been at refinery. Like if I came in at 11, no one would think twice about it. So I had a period of time where I was just kind of like dating everybody in Brooklyn (laughs) and staying out really late. And I ended up with a series of relationships that were really bad for me. It was like, I just wanted so badly to like be having fun, be doing the things that I thought someone my age should be doing that I forgot to consider like how someone treats me is the most important thing about them. So I went for people who I thought were cool and like kind of aspirational and, and it sucked. It was like, it was so messy and bad. And it was like, at a certain point, dating just started to feel like breaking up and And they're all like overlapped with each other too. And then I would just like go to work and be managing 15 people. And it was really hard. And at the same time, my eating disorder really flared up. So it was like, and I wrote about this a lot in the book, which is that there's this idea as women that the less we need, the more successful we are. And to me, that was like, I don't need anything from anybody. I can date people who don't give me anything because I don't need anything. And also like, I can be really skinny because I don't even need food. Like that all got tangled up for me. And it was like reaching this fever pitch as I was getting promoted and promoted and promoted. And like the more depressed and the skinnier I got, the more successful I was at work. And it became really hard for me to untangle one from the other. One of the things that I really appreciate about the way that you wrote and the way that you share is your honest talk about even being in an industry that can at times perpetuate eating disorders. And something that stood out to me as I was reading last night was you were talking about being at Fashion Week and, you know, the models are, you know, 2% of people in the entire world could even fit into the clothes that they're wearing. They're almost like human hangers. What was it like being in an industry? 
that is kind of built off of profiting from our feelings about how we look and our body. It was horrific. <sighs> That's a really honest answer. Thank you. Yeah. And I I had come from the world of feminism and activism. Like I was yeah. a women's studies major. I I was really active in my community. I was an organizer of the New York City Dyke March and we did like radical actions all year long. And then suddenly one thing led to another and I was in the world of women's aesthetics. Yes. And it was like, it was hard because I I have always cared about things like clothes and makeup and hair like that just comes really naturally to me as something I'm like good at and enjoy a lot but it was like it was totally at odds with what my background was and so it never felt right and I always felt like I was some sort of infiltrator and the point to me being in those spaces was to take them down from within yeah Walk me through what that is, because I 100% agree with your story. What was it like to see what was being presented or to see who was on the cover and knowing that like you desired something entirely differently and you were going to go in and do what you could to change? In hindsight, I feel impressed with that like ballsier, younger version of myself (laughs) because- At no point was I like, I need to keep my head down so that I can keep this job. I was like, this is messed up. I'm going to say something about it until someone listens to me. And I feel like now in my 30s, I have more fear. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, And I just, I didn't at the time for whatever reason. So it was like, baby steps and big steps, starting with like my first job out of college, which wasn't in women's media yet. It was in, I guess, what's technically feminist media on the Issues magazine. And I overheard people having a really transphobic conversation. And I got the CEO to agree to do sensitivity trainings for the entire staff. And like, I was 22 and just marched into her office and was like, this is a thing that happened. This needs to change. And I tried to keep that energy up in all of my next jobs. And at Refinery, when I was an editorial assistant, I ended up writing an addendum to the style guide to give people a way to talk about queer people. And I called it the primer for radical inclusivity. And that's language that they still use in their in their marketing materials and in their internal documents and i i feel like i wasn't even aware of like what long term impact was it just it felt like immediate problems that i needed to solve because if i didn't no one else would oh, i think that's so powerful and i think to as a reader's perspective It was really interesting for me to consider that you were considered, quote, other in terms of your orientation. And because of that, quote, title, you became the point person where everyone came to you to ask you questions about it. And I think that we're at such a pivotal time in history where people are wanting to learn and people are wanting to understand or to be correct in the way that they're speaking. What was it like kind of becoming that point person when you weren't even designated or paid to be that person for a team? I didn't love it, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) I felt very tokenized. Mm -hmm. And I just, I felt like I didn't fit in. And like, no one would let me forget that I didn't fit in. Hmm. And in hindsight, I don't think that that feeling is based on fact, because I did look like them because I was white and thin and young and being gay wasn't the difference that I felt like it was at the time. And that maybe other people felt like, I, I don't know what kind of access I would have had to what spaces if I had been a queer person of color. Yeah. And I wish I had had that kind of understanding at the time because all I could think was how different I was. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a a really good point. And I think it's interesting to look back on things and ask, is that factor feeling? And I yeah. think that's where we learn the most, especially when we look at our journey. 
one thing I really want to talk about because I literally was underlining every word. And I think that it's really important conversation, especially in the business world that has not been had enough. And so one of my favorite parts of your book was where you talked about something that a lot of people in business talk about, which is an ideal client or like your ideal reader. Mm -hmm. And I loved, and I'm in full agreement that if we are creating with only one person in mind with this quote avatar, that it's impossible for our work to be truly inclusive. And we're likely leaving out populations of people who could be impacted by the work we do. Let's talk about this. Yes. I'm so glad you asked about this. You're the first person to mention that point. Oh, I was like, this is so necessary. And it's honestly something full transparency that I didn't even start to think about until this past year when I realized my ideal client looks like me five years ago, right? Like that's (laughs) problematic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like what was so annoying about trying to point this out to marketing people was that they were just like, but that's just like marketing language. Like it doesn't literally mean that we just want one type of of woman. And I was like, okay, so if it doesn't mean that, why do we have to say it? Like, and I think people are just get so used to certain kinds of language that they stop being aware of the implications and the effects of that language. And when you say, who's your reader or who's your consumer, you're singularizing it and you're, inherently limiting it. And in trying to imagine your ideal person for the thing that you're doing, like A, it's offensive. B, it's a bad business decision. Like why not think about what you're making as something that's more of a plurality that can do different things that reach certain people? Because I think like that's one of the mistakes that women's media made in the 2010s was trying to make everything for everybody and just watering it down to try to make it more appealing instead of speaking specifically to different kinds of people because their experiences and their differences are valid and are deserved of different content. Flowdesk was created by two female founders to solve the email challenges that the other platforms just couldn't solve. Flowdesk is a favorite among my students with over 4,500 gold diggers on the platform today. To start, grow, or refresh your email list strategy with gorgeous customizable templates, sleek and easy to install forms, simple to set up audience segments and automated workflows, try Flowdesk. Use my link to lock in at half off your subscription. That's $19 a month for life at jennacutcher.com slash Flowdesk. Flowdesk is an easy to use, intuitive, and beautiful solution to email marketing. You don't need to learn how to be a copywriter, graphic designer, and website developer to start and grow your email list. Flowdesk includes beautifully designed templates, many with pre-written copy you can use and adapt for your own brand's voice. You can create forms and pop-ups for opt-ins even if you don't have a website yet, plus behind-the-scenes insights to track your progress and email success. You'll have unlimited everything. There's no subscription tier. It's all yours from day one. So you can learn, grow, implement, and market to your list for $19 a month. No limits, no lock templates, all of the features you need to grow and serve your email list. Your monthly subscription is $19 a month. If you sign up at jennacutcher.com slash flowdesk, that's jennacutcher.com slash F-L-O-D-E-S-K. Tell me your favorite part about running a business. Is it A, filing taxes, B, running payroll, C, managing benefits and HR needs, or D, none of the above? If you're like me, those parts of running a business are necessary, but are definitely not my favorite part. So if you answer D, try Gusto. I've teamed up with Gusto and they're offering you three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash gold digger. Gusto is an online payroll benefits and HR built for modern small businesses with all the management tools you need on one platform. Gusto automatically files and pays all state and local and federal payroll taxes. Plus the fast, easy to run payroll includes W2s and 1099s for your team, as well as tools to manage health benefits, 401ks, and more for almost any budget. On average, running payroll with Gusto takes just 11 minutes, and you'll get three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash gold digger. That's three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash gold digger. 
Yes. How did you actually shift from thinking of that one person or even, you know, help your team shift from imagining that quote ideal reader into more of a community of diverse faces, different backgrounds, different aspirations? Did you have any tools or things or exercises that you did that was helpful? Oh, good question. I mean, it became really apparent when I was working on Nylon Digital and we still had a nylon print that there was a difference between the digital reader and the print reader. Mm, So that kind of set us up already to start talking about the idea of at least two different kinds of readers. But in my head, I never tried to think about one person. And that is actually a lesson that I have learned When I was maybe 20 and I was working on the New York City Dyke March, and which for anyone who doesn't know, it's a protest that happens annually on the day before Gay Pride. It's about... I want to say like 25 years old at this point and it's all activist run. It doesn't have any corporate interest. So it's a really cool thing to do. And I designed the posters for it. And I, it was the... God, I think it was the 18th year and the theme was barely legal, which was supposed to be funny. And I drew an image of a woman with her hands cuffed in like a sexy way and was subsequently torn apart on the internet. No one knew that I had been the one to draw it, but everyone was like, how can you attach one single body How can you attach a white body to the idea of incarceration and et cetera, et cetera. And it was like this huge turning point for me because I realized that like once you, once you attach a body to something, you are saying, that's who I picture for this. That's who this is for. And when you're doing it on behalf of an organization, it feels like it's the organization saying, this is who we're for. And I kept that with me always. And I, from then on, always tried to avoid attaching someone's physicality to a brand. So when it was up to me, when I became editor in chief, I made a you know, I made a whole PowerPoint about it and I sat the whole company down and I was like, look, these are the things we're not going to say anymore. We're not going to say who's your reader. We're not going to talk about our reader as a she. And like, also here's a list of banned words. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't understand and it took a lot of workshops, but eventually we all got on board. I think that's so powerful. And It's crazy, Gabrielle, to look at like your leadership through a lot of things that were almost ahead of your time and how you just kept going. Is that where you you look back and you're like, wow, I was gutsy. This is awesome. (laughs) I mean, I yes and no. Like, I always feel like there's more I could have been doing. Yeah, I still feel about it. I think we will always feel like that as achievers. Yeah, I think so, too. Okay, so one of the things that really caught my attention is your thoughts on social media. So talk to me about your relationship with social media. And then let's dive into that just a little bit. Oh, God, it's such a love. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I have started to feel like the ultimate aspiration and like the ultimate sign of success would be being able to leave social media and not Mm -hmm. worrying about it harming future work opportunities. Like I just feel so tethered to it. And it's, I mean, at this point, it's like the way that I get through it is that it's not a literal reflection of my real life. Like I'm not documenting my day as I go through it. I'm like very specifically curating a feed by doing that. I do feel like I can protect myself a little bit more. And I think, I think my feelings about it and my feelings about being public in general have kind of evolved with my feelings of like contentment with my life Mm -hmm. and like the happier I am with myself and with what my life is, the less desire I have to talk about it publicly. Yes. Yes. That is so powerful. My husband recently just deleted Instagram off his phone and he was like, honestly, I'm good. Like I don't need to (laughs) scroll through strangers lives to, to feel worse or better. Like I'm good. And I was like, that is so awesome. Like I think one of the points that you made that I, I don't think I had ever 
thought about was like when Instagram came out, it was supposed to be like this real life, like yeah. you're sharing in the moment. It's these instantaneous things. And, and it was almost like, and I love the line where you said, it's like people, you know, it's like celebrities are just like us, but now it's turned into such an aspirational place, which can hold its space in terms of inspiring you. But now it's like, look, you need to be like me. And I think even just that shift in thinking about how it was created and what it's evolved into should dramatically shape the way we as users use it. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I don't think there's a lot of institutional memory for like the things that we use. Like, I don't think people remember what it felt like when Instagram came out and it was like the power was in our own hands to (laughs) illustrate our own lives on the internet and anybody could do it. You were given the same amount of space as anyone else. We suddenly saw like celebrities at home in pajamas and it was like kind of punk rock. And then once people realized, oh, wait, I can edit these things. I can curate these things to make a point. It immediately switched from like, I'm just like you to look how perfect I am. Yeah, absolutely. So when Nylon's print magazine folded and digital media was the path forward and you were the person to carve that path, did you bring anything from the more traditional media way of thinking into your digital strategy and direction? I know you lived in that digital space, but was the old way of doing things completely abandoned when everything folded or was it a mix of the traditional and the new digital way of doing things? It was a mix because Nylon the magazine was super iconic and people really loved the covers in particular. So I decided to keep the idea of covers and the idea of monthly themes. I just changed all of the themes to reflect the things that I knew our digital readers were interested in. But the cover remained the thing that we invested most heavily in every month And I think by keeping that kind of infrastructure in place, we were able to continue like the energy of the magazine. I love that. So where can everybody find you now? What are you doing now? Tell us what's happened since your book came out, where you find yourself today, because it's been quite a journey and an unexpected one to say the least. Yeah, totally. So After I left Nylon, I ended up going back to Refinery29 as the fashion director. I proposed to Wallace, we're engaged. And then I left Refinery after a year and took a job at Netflix running social media for their LGBTQ plus platform, which is called Most. And we are supposed to move to LA at some point and obviously keep moving it because of the pandemic. But basically, I think when I left Nylon, I really needed a total life change. And instead, I took a baby step and went back to refinery and the universe was like, nope. (laughs) (laughs) Pivot, pivot. (laughs) Yeah, it was like, I just needed something totally different. So I'm in entertainment now and it's pretty amazing. I like, I love doing work without a byline and I love not being the face of someone else's thing. It's like, it's so soothing to me. Oh, how has it been? launching this book and putting this book out into the world. Talk to me about that feeling. It's the scariest thing I've ever done. Like, because when you write a book like this, how people feel about the book is how people feel about you. And like, I know logically I'm supposed to separate out people hating the book from people hating me, but that's not how it feels. And I've been... uh, I finally like tore myself away from Goodreads. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> a positive change. I mean, mostly the response has been so nice. I have been so overwhelmed and touched by the responses I'm getting from people. I was really scared for people I know reading it. Like yes. that felt scarier than strangers reading it because a lot of things in the book are things that nobody knew about other than like my, you know, like Wallace and my family. Yeah. So it's been a lot of hard conversations, but I mean, it's been good. And I'm so thankful that I was able to do virtual events. Like the strand in New York was supposed to host my launch event and they did it online. 
it feels like at this point, so it came out in January, so it's been a couple months and it feels like the word of mouth has really helped like so yeah. much more even than like splashy press a week in advance has just been people saying like my sister told me to read it. My mom got it for me. Like I think, I think women are recommending it to other women, which is obviously like the best compliment I could ask for. Oh, I love that. Looking back over to the last decade of your life, is there anything you wish you could do differently or have a do over on? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I don't even know where to start, but like, (laughs) I think mostly I wish I would have stood up for myself more. I, I wish that like when I knew something was bad for me, I would have just abandoned it instead of trying to make it better whether it was a job or a relationship. And then the things that keep me up at night are the times that I could have been kinder to people. Mm. Like I was so stressed out and so worried about my own career that there were moments that I think I accidentally dismissed people and I didn't mean to, and I know that it hurt them. And those are, those are the things that I wish I had a chance to do better. One of the things that I think is so interesting about your story is that you landed in a role that is a prestigious role. It's, it's, you know, a title of success. What would you tell to somebody who is working up towards a title or this identity that you wish you would have known? Because once you arrived, it felt way different than you had expected. I would say, think about what you're going to want to do after that. Yeah. Because I think so many of us fall into this trap of having a goal and thinking that like, once you meet that goal, that's it. Like you don't have to have goals after that. And for me, thinking about what I would do after being an editor in chief felt really impossible. And I wish that I could have had the perspective to understand like, this is a job that you will have in a series of other jobs. It doesn't have to be your whole life. It doesn't have to be the ultimate thing you're working towards. It's like a step along the way and every step builds on the step that came before it. So I think, I think just keeping in mind that like nothing is the final thing unless you're talking about retiring. Yes. Which I think we're a little far away from that, right? (laughs) I I would love to retire. (laughs) One of the things that I think is really compelling, and, and honestly, I feel it in my life as well, is when you are kind of the center of the brand, when you are the face and the voice of the brand, I think you do hit a point in your life where you crave privacy more and where success lives offline in those moments that never see the light of Instagram. What has been the biggest shift for you in your 30s and kind of in this transformative period that we all find ourselves in right now? Yeah. I mean, and I would love to know what you think about it too, because you have so many followers. I'm like, Mm. I'm stressed out by my 11.5 thousand followers. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how, I don't know how you do it, but it's like, it does feel like something that I become less and less interested in participating in. And I would love to just be like successful at something creative and not a public person. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's possible anymore. It's kind of like you have to be Angelina Jolie to get off Instagram. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But I mean, and I know that it's a contradiction too, because I just wrote a tell all book. So it's like, I think I'm still working out for myself, how much of me I want to share and how much of me I want to keep private. But like, in this pandemic world, I haven't for one second had the urge to post a photo of myself just like at home in my sweatsuit where I've been for a year. <laughs> you know, like I've been thinking a lot about like what old photos can I dig up that doesn't feel tacky? How can yeah. I let people know that like things suck? without complaining. And like, I lost someone and I didn't post about it online. And that felt like a very positive decision. I mean, it's all kind of like negotiations with myself. 
Yes. Oh, I can so relate. And I think to, you know, the more eyes and the more voices you let into your life, the better you have to be at discerning feedback and criticism and understanding which role and how much power you give that into your world. And I think, too, it really forces you to keep your head down and and stay true to whatever mission you're on. And I think I've been exploring, and your book has really just inspired me a lot, in, in just the shifting of identities that we as women go through. Like, we are not one thing forever. We're constantly changing and growing in relationships, in the seasons of life, whether it's career or motherhood or marriage or whatever that looks like for people. And so I've just been really kind of exploring like which identities feel the most important. What does success look like? And I think, you know, it's a discussion a lot of us are having offline these days. Totally. And I too am thinking about that. And I'm also like really curious to see like what people want from me. Like I basically got like 2000 followers over a weekend, which for me, you know, was a lot. It was a a big percentage and it was people going through and liking all of the photos of Wallace. (laughs) 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 And and I was talking to someone about, I was talking to a friend about it and he was like, you know, people are really interested in your relationship. Like you should look into that and post more of that. Cause like, that's really cute. And people really like that. And I was kind of like, I don't, think I want to do that. Like Wallace has a public account for her art, but her personal account is private. And I don't want to like drag her into the public eye just because I made a decision to write about our relationship in a book. And now people are like looking us up. Isn't that funny? I know even my husband yesterday was like, do you, do people even know I still exist? And I was like, I'm just respecting your digital boundaries right now. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, what a juggling act. So what are you excited about? I feel like the world needs more joy. What's bringing you excitement in this year in these days? Thank you for asking this question. So I'm excited to move. I have lived in New York since 2007, and I'm really ready to be in a warm place. Yes. I'm writing a novel. Awesome. And that's really fun and scary because I've been working on it for a year, and now it's like, oh, God, what if no one wants it? But it, it is fun to work on. And I'm, I mean, I'm excited to think about the future because I finally have a job where like work-life balance is part of the conversation, and I just yeah. I can't wait to get vaccinated and get my life back and experience what it's like to have work that begins and ends and then have the rest of my life. Mm, That's amazing. That is so incredible. Where can everybody find you, connect with you, read your book? Give us all of the places. Totally. So I'm on Instagram. It's at Gabrielle Corn, and that's corn with a K. And then on Twitter, it's at Gabrielle underscore corn. And my book is pretty much wherever books are sold. But if you can't find it, there is a link in my bio on both platforms. Amazing. Gabrielle, thank you so much for coming on the show today, for sharing your story. I cannot encourage people more to go grab your book. It's just been a really eye-opening, exciting read and into a world that I have never personally been exposed to. And so I feel like I get to learn right alongside of you in that journey. And so thank you for your words. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was so great talking to you. Reading Gabrielle's story has been so eye-opening for me. I think a lot of times in the world we live in, it's easy to look at people's lives unfolding online and we think, man, they have it perfect. It must be the best. But often behind closed doors, especially as women who are driven and career focused, we can get lost in that chase. Reading her story of ups and downs, of struggles and triumphs has been really insightful. And I would totally encourage you to go grab her book. I am so honored and elated that I have a position that I can send a DM and say, I'm reading your book and get to pick someone's brain like Gabrielle's. Her story is incredible. And I hope today's episode leaves you feeling inspired and excited and not filled with regrets because as we continue to move forward and move on with our lives, we do so with the knowledge we gained from our past experiences. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. 
Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 